And I would like to, uh, my name is Sandy Ross, and I'm the president of California Protective Parents Association. We're the lead sponsor on the bill, and I'm here proudly to introduce our champion for domestic violence survivors and children, Senator Susan Rubio. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm State Senator Susan Rubio. I represent the San Gabriel Valley and parts of the Inland Empire. We're gonna take a little pause to fix the audio. Hello, once again, I'm State Senator Susan Rubio. I represent the San Gabriel Valley and portions of the Inland Empire. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. Let's try it again. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining us here today. And I really want to thank uh, the media that came out to cover such an important issue. I'm State Senator Susan Rubio. I represent the San Gabriel Valley, as well as portions of the Inland Empire. Today, I stand here with victims of domestic violence survivors, and parents who have suffered unimaginable tragedy. They have lost their children to an abusive partner. And I continue to be angry that we're here once again and more children are dying at the hands of abusers. I'm angry that our children are left in homes where we know abuse happens in homes where children are coming back to their primary parent saying that, saying that they're afraid, they're saying that they're being hurt, they're saying don't send me back, and yet we continue to send these children back in homes that we know that there is danger. I wanna pause for a second to acknowledge some children that we've lost. These are children that just go unannounced, under the radar, I want to highlight some of them right now. Bella Fontanelle, six years old, kindergarten. She was bludgeoned to death in her father's home who had shared custody. She was murdered by his girlfriend. Kaylani, 10 years old. Kaden, 13 years old, brother and sister. They were shot to death by their father in 2020 after their mother filed for divorce. And there's so many more that we're here to mourn. So thank you for being here to hear these stories. With me today are parents that will share their own stories of heartbreak. But I want to point out two parents in particular that are here with us today. First of all, I wanna highlight Anna Steves, who's Peaky's mom whose name, his name, honors. I also stand here with Ileana, who lost her three beautiful daughters as recently as last year here in Sacramento, once again at the hands of an abuser. We knew there was danger, and yet these beautiful girls were put in harm's way. All of these children will never get to grow up all of these children will never going to graduate from high school. They're never gonna walk down the aisle. They're never going to realize their full potential because the system failed them. All of these children were in situations where court mandated visitations made it difficult for them to come home. And I also want to highlight a young woman in my city, my district, Yesli Velasquez Gonzalez and her five-year-old little boy that was murdered last year, once again in my hometown, by her boyfriend. SB 331 is a critical bill that will reform family court during child custody proceedings. It will do several things. Limit court's ability to order reunification therapy at non-regulated, unlicensed facilities that rip children away from their primary parent, away from their home, away from their schools, and away from 
their community, where they feel safe, where they have friends, where they love their teacher. It keeps happening over and over again. And the trauma these children experience is unacceptable. It's going to require judicial counsel to establish additional domestic violence and child abuse training for judges and everyone involved in family court matters. Lastly, the bill will direct judicial counsel to collect and report judicial training data to improve future outcomes and save children's lives, which is why we're here today. This bill is critically important because families with children that are in danger continue to call and cry out for help. For the victims, the details change. Some of them have restraining orders. Some of them go through the legal system. Some have boyfriends, ex-boyfriends that are trying to just harm them, get back at them. In the end, no one is safe unless we do something about it, unless we pass Peaky's Law 331. In fact, many times victims are in bigger danger after they make the important decision to leave an abusive relationship, after they realize that they will not survive if they stay in that abusive relationship. Many victims of domestic violence do the right thing, decide to walk away to save their children, and that's when they're in danger the most. These abusers want to harm their reputation, want to ruin them, and they go as far as to killing their own children just to ensure that they harm their victims. We need to change this system that is not working. It's not working for our children and it's not working for victims of domestic violence. We need to demand accountability from this, these abusers and we need to continue to protect children. We are losing children across our nation every year and this is where we can be helpful. We need to pass Peaky's Law. We need to change a system that claims to put safety of children first, but yet we continue to send children where we know there's danger, where we know there's documented abuse. I want to look at the mother behind me. I want all of us to listen to their stories. I want all of us to understand the pain that they've gone through and the courage that it takes for them to be here with me today to continue to save children in the future from being murdered at the hands of an abusive parent. This bill gives children and families hope that help is on its way. So now I would like to introduce a dear friend, the mother of Peaky, who is from my district, district and who has been a champion for victims. She's used her voice and her heartbreak to continue to reform laws, not just in California, but across our nation. Please help me welcome Ana Esteves. Good morning. I would like to begin by recognizing Senator Susan Rubio for her incredible work an ongoing commitment to keeping victims and children safe from abuse and violence, and for leading the efforts in family court reform. I also thank you, the media, for being here today to cover this very important topic that impacts so many people, past, present, and future. I also want to acknowledge the co-authors from both the Senate and Assembly who are courageously sponsoring and supporting Senate Bill 313 also known as Peaky's Law. And as the Senator said, my name is Ana Estevez, and I am here as a constituent, a mother, a veteran of the United States Army, a former elementary school principal, but most importantly, an advocate for children who suffer at the hands of an abusive parent and who fall victim to our family court system. It has been seven years since I first stepped foot into a family courtroom. And I must say that children are no safer today from the dysfunction and harmful system than they were in 2016. Children are still being ordered into the custody of an abusive parent, are still being ripped away from protective parents only to be brainwashed into believing that abuse does not exist. And they're still dying 
by the hands of an abusive parent. Senate Bill 331 is named after my son, Peaky, who was brutally murdered by his father on April 21st of 2017. Peaky's father suffocated him in the back seat of his vehicle while he slept after spending a day-long visit at Disneyland. His father then proceeded to dispose of his body in a heavily wooded area in Santa Barbara County. My son's whereabouts were unknown for 71 days until his father confessed to murdering him in a final act of revenge for me wanting a divorce. According to LA County Sheriff Homicide Detective Aguilera, during his confession, my ex-husband stated that he wanted to give Peaky the best last day of his life. My son was five years, two months, and two days old when he took his last breath. In April 2016, I told my ex-husband I wanted a divorce. And during the divorce proceedings, I fought really hard to protect my son from his abusive father. I documented in writing to the court that I feared for our safety, explained my ex-husband's erratic and abusive behavior, and provided evidence to support my statements. I filed restraining orders, subpoenaed law enforcement officers to testify, and requested sole custody with supervised visits. My son was fearful of his father and experienced both physical and emotional abuse during his forced visits. He repeatedly begged, please don't make me go, Mama. And despite every effort that I made to protect my son, my request for restraining order, sole custody, and supervised visits were denied. Reckless and uninformed decisions made by the judges who presided over my case empowered my ex-husband and gave him the ability to methodically plan and execute the murder of my only child. As the Senator said, there are important provisions in this bill, but the provision that I would like to highlight is that pertaining to the training program to be established by the Judicial Council. Not only is targeted training for judges needed, it is essential. The practice of placing inexperienced, ill-prepared judicial officers in family law courtrooms is not only incomprehensible, it is reckless. Judges are assigned to family court without proper training, background, or depth of knowledge needed to make informed findings related to domestic violence, abuse cases, and other complex topics related to family law. The first judge who presided over my case was appointed to the bench in 2012 after practicing 28 years of complex business litigation at private law firms. Ironically, the second judge who presided over my case was appointed in 2016 and also served 28 years as a complex business litigator at private law firms. Both judges had zero experience with family law before being appointed to the bench, but were still assigned to oversee complex family matters and make decisions that ultimately devastated lives. In my case, three lives were destroyed. My son was brutally murdered by his father. My ex-husband is now serving 25 years to life in prison for murdering my only child and my sentence is life without my son. Would the outcome of my case be different if judges were educated and well-versed in domestic violence issues? Yes, I wholeheartedly believe it, believe it would be. I cannot think of a licensed profession where an individual is not required to complete training prior to a license renewal. Physicians in California are required to complete 50 hours of continuing medical education every two years before renewing their license. When I was a teacher, as well as the senator, when we had to renew our teaching credential, we were required to complete 150 hours of professional development over the course of five years. And as a current administrator, I am required to renew not only my teaching credential, but also my administrative services credential every five years. And in addition to the credentialing requirement, I am required to complete annual training that focuses on but is not limited to child abuse and neglect, 
suicide prevention, harassment, and implicit bias. Having family law judges complete training is not an unreasonable ask. Complex issues arise every day in family court. If we truly want to protect children and make child safety a priority, we need to ensure judges and other court-related professionals are well prepared for the heavy lift that awaits them every day in family court. This bill is the first of many steps to make that happen. And I ask every legislator to put themselves in my shoes and the shoes of other parent survivors and ask themselves, if my child was murdered, what would I want lawmakers to do to prevent something similar from happening in the future? Tomorrow, Peaky's Law will be heard in the Assembly Judiciary, and the fate of the bill lies in the hands of the committee members. Now is the time for meaningful reform and accountability. Now is the time for Senate Bill 331, Peaky's Law. Thank you. I want to thank Anna for her just bravery and her courage to continue the fight on behalf of so many parents out there. I, I want to bring up Ileana Gutierrez. Ileana lost her three girls last year when she was forced to share custody. They were placed in the hands of her abuser who had a current restraining order. She will tell her story in Spanish and we will help translate. Ileana? Buenos dias. Uh, mi nombre es Ileana Gutierrez. Um, estoy aquí el día de hoy en representación de mis hijas, Samia, Samantha y Samara, que al igual que Ana, perdió, perdí a mis hijas por culpa de un mal sistema de jueces que en realidad no saben lo que significa la violencia doméstica, que no es un caso más, que es algo realmente difícil vivir en esa situación, que es difícil salir de una situación así, que es tan difícil para los niños cuando no quieren ir a visitar a su papá y que no te queda otra más que mandarlos porque es algo que te dijo el juez que tienes que hacer. De verdad es muy importante que apoyemos cambios, nuevas leyes, porque eso no puede seguir pasando. O cuántos niños más necesitan que mueran para que hagan un cambio real. Es tan difícil despertar todos los días y que tienes que aceptar que tus hijos ya no están por una mala práctica. Porque un juez te dice que tus hijos no pueden estar protegidos, que tienen que ver a su padre o a su madre y que no están escuchando realmente lo que dices, que la otra parte está mal. De verdad es importante, muy importante, cambiar, cambiar leyes y cambiar un mal sistema. Gracias. Mm -hmm. 
Once again, her name is Ileana. She lost her three little girls, Simia, Samara, and Samantha, last year at the hands of her abuser, who had a restraining order. She wants to highlight that she shares Anna Stevis's pain. Just like Anna, the system failed her. She just remembers how difficult it was to send her three little girls to visit her father. Their father went. They didn't want to. She remembers today having to wake up every day knowing that her three little girls are not with her anymore. She feels that the court system failed her, that she lost her children to the deficiencies of family court. She's here to ensure that we change the system, that we pass Peaky's law to ensure that no other family has to suffer what she's suffering, that she no longer has her three little girls with her. She discussed herself as a victim of domestic violence and how difficult it is for victims to walk away. She was trapped in that situation and it, she struggled to separate and walk away. And when she did, she struggled with the decision of the judge knowing that he was abusive, she had a restraining order and there was nothing she could do. So she's here to insist that we pass these laws to help protect future victims. She knows that we cannot help her, but she wants to help those that may be in danger now, that may be murdered today, tomorrow, and the coming days. I want to thank Ileana for her bravery to, to join us, to add her voice to the growing number of parents that have lost their children. It's not easy. It was last year. Her entire family was devastated. And just like Anna, she is now having to live the rest of her life without her beautiful three little girls. So I want to thank her for being here with us today. Thank you. I would like to invite Amy Hunter to join us, who lost her two daughters. They were murdered at the hands of an abuser. Good morning. My name is Amy Hunter, and I'd like to tell you a little about my daughters. Sophia was 12, a smart, stubborn, and compassionate kid who loved science, enjoyed painting, and liked to read. Her favorite book was The Hunger Games. She taught herself to ride a bike when she was two and got rid of her training wheels before she was four. She loved to eat spicy things so much that she was nicknamed the Jalapeno Girl. Her favorite color was purple. She was passionate about human rights, and she wanted to find ways to combine her love of science with traveling the world to help people in third world countries. She had a great deal of empathy and she made friends with kids who were being bullied or who were lonely. Sarah was nine and was a quick-witted and funny extrovert who said everything like it was a pronouncement and was a leader amongst her friends, coming up with games that usually involved secret missions to get out of doing homework. She loved being a Girl Scout, and she loved pink and dresses that swirled when she twirled. At school, she was known for defending smaller kids against bullies, and she didn't suffer fools. She was passionate about math and wanted to be a mathematician for NASA. She was the kind of kid who never met a stranger and would strike up a conversation with anyone who would stand still long enough. When I escaped their father in 2012, I applied to the courts for a restraining order. When we appeared before the judge, my ex-husband said that I was lying about him being abusive, and in response, the judge told me, if that's true, then you should be ashamed of yourself. And it confirmed what he had always told me, that no one would believe me. Eventually, in 2014, I obtained a restraining order, order which led to near constant harassment from the ex-husband. Twice he was arrested for violations of the restraining order. I was told that if there was any evidence that the order was violated within the next two years, he would be arrested and again and go to trial. In the meantime, I was going to family court every three months. I spoke with mediators, as did my daughters. At one point, I was told that I should not talk to my children about their visits with their father because that would be viewed as parental alienation. So I sent them to a therapist. 
After their deaths, the, their therapist told me that she had tried submitting reports to the court several times and even reported their father to CPS, but nothing changed. The DA's office contacted me 18 months after three initial police reports were f filed to, investi to investigate violations of the restraining order. I'm told that they discovered 247 violations over the course of the previous year. Eventually, he was arrested, but I was not informed of that until much later. He killed my daughters on December 31st, 2017, just eight days before his court date. According to the investigating officer, he left a suicide note detailing how he had spent the months from his arrest, planning how he would commit the murder-suicide and blaming me for it. I will spend the rest of my life wondering, could I have prevented their deaths if I had known that he was arrested? I will spend the rest of my life wondering, if the law had taken my reports of his threats seriously, would my children be alive now? I'll never know the answers to that question, but I do know that I will do everything in my power to ensure that no other parent ever has to ask themselves that question. Peaky's law will mean that judges and others who perform duties in family law matters must undergo trainings to recognize and respond to domestic violence and child abuse in order to prioritize child safety in custody proceedings. And more importantly, it will save the lives of those children. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for sharing your story. Next, I want to invite Tina Swithin, who is here to read the statement of two young individuals who cannot be here for fear that they're going to be killed, kidnapped, and so they asked if they can submit a statement and have it be read instead. And so we wanted to add their voices, and I'm going to ask Tina to read their statements. Thank you. First, I want to say that when Maya Lang reached out to me in October of 2022, she secured a place in my heart forever. And I will never stop champion, championing for Maya and her little brother, Sebastian. So I'm honored to read her statement today. In this society, we teach children that when you need protection, when an adult harms you or you are afraid, you should ask for help. We are taught to go to our parents, the police, the doctor, or a school counselor. When me and my brother finally got up the courage to talk about how our mother abused us, we did exactly what we were taught. We went all of those places. We told our dad, we told the doctor, the police, and our school counselors, along with others. When I told the court-ordered reunification therapist, her first response was to tell my mother, to tell my abuser that I had talked, that I hadn't kept it quiet what my mother did. The therapist assigned in family court put me in danger. The mandated reporter reported first to the abuser. We are forced to tell our story over and over again, searching everywhere we could go for anyone who would protect us, but no one did. Not one person in any of those agencies helped us beyond taking a report. Instead of being protected, we were sent back with our mom, so we ran, because that was our only option. We kept running each time we were taken back to her. This continued until there was a court date. They were going to try more intensive options. I went to the courthouse and I testified. I told my story again, forced to confront my abuser, my own mother. I was interrogated by her lawyer, treated like a criminal, treated as though I was the abuser and my mother was the victim. This was in front of the judge, my mother and my father. The judge did nothing to protect me or even lessen the trauma of telling my story of abuse in front of my abuser. On October 20th, one day before, after I testified, 
the court decided to call me a liar, ignoring my testimony and giving full custody to our mother who had abused me and my brother. We had been trying to gain protection from her for two years at this point. The night we were violently taken, we were kidnapped. It was approved by a court order, but that does not make it okay or right. It was the most terrifying and traumatic event of my and my brother's lives, a night that still haunts us both. We were hiding in our grandmother's house. The transport agents came and tried to get into the house, but we wouldn't let them. The police were there. They let the transport agents into the house. We ran into the garage and out of the house. The transport agents and police surrounded us. We grabbed onto our friends and family who we had called to be there. We told the transport agents and police to leave. We pled with them. We told them they were sending us back to our abuser. They would not listen to us. Eventually, the transport agents and police threatened our friends, family, until they were forced to let us go. Three fully grown adults, large adults, we did not even know, first cornered us and then ripped us away, kicking and screaming. They picked us up by the arms and legs and dragged us to their car. The police stood there and watched this, even turning their backs on us so that their body cams wouldn't record what was happening. As they tried to wrestle me into the car, my head hit against the car door and I partially lost consciousness. I tried to wrestle free and escape, but they grabbed me and pressed me against the ground. A large man kneeled over me. One of my legs was in the air being pulled into the car by another large transport agent. During this, my jeans were pulled off by the one in the car. My friends, family, and police watched as I was undressed in the struggle. Then I was shoved into the car. I was held down onto the floor of the car by the agents until we got onto the freeway. We sat in the back sobbing and trying not to let go of each other, during which time I realized I had a split open lip that was bleeding. And this is a statement from Sebastian, her little brother who is 12 years old. I held on to my sister until one of the transport agents tried to grab her. She let go of me and tried to keep them from grabbing us. This is when one of them picked me up. They carried me to the car as I screamed and tried to fight them off. They shoved me into the car and then against the seat by my neck, hurting me. Afterwards, we were taken to a hotel and an Airbnb. I would wake up in the middle of the night screaming and crying. I was having dreams that I was being taken again. Maya goes on to say, after suffering the extreme trauma, I'm sorry, after suffering that extreme trauma, it did not end. We spent the next week with the transport agents at a reunification camp with the owner of the reunification camp and the therapists. They interrogated, interrogated us for four days, six hours per day. They laughed at us, called us sociopaths and abusers ourselves for talking about our mother's abuse of us. They threatened, saying we would, not, saying we would be sent to a wilderness camp where they would not give us food or blankets if they, we did not do what they wanted. There was nothing good about reunification camp. By the end, what we had learned was that to survive, we needed to pretend our abuse never happened and completely comply with everything and anything we were told to do. The therapists, our mother, and the transport agents who remained with us would not accept the truth, choosing to call us liars and discount our accusations as lies and false memories. But after those four days, it was still not over. We spent seven months living with our abuser with no safety net or privacy or communication. While living with our mother, I was punished for even viewing the news stories about us and asking our attorney if we could talk to our dad or return to Santa Cruz. We were sent back to reunification camp with the reunification camp owner and our therapist for a second time. We went seven months, 
with no communication with our father, stepmother, step-siblings, who we truly consider our true family. I did not get to communicate with friends or anyone else from my life outside of my mother's family and a few of her friends. Me and my brother lived in fear of being sent back to reunification camp or somewhere even worse. No one was even allowed to know where we were. We were forced to change our last name and hide our experience from everyone. No one, sorry, this is our family court system. This is what was deemed in our best interest. We are living with friends now as some type of refugees. We are being hunted by our mother. She is still trying to get us, trying to force us back into some sort of re reunification camp or other imprisonment. The same judge that ordered this is still in charge of our case. The judge won't let us be free. Peaky's law will end this. It will protect us and it will protect other children. Thank you. I thought it was important to allow the voice of these children that have been impacted to, to be heard. And I don't want to dismiss anyone's stories or invalidate their experience. Every single person has a different experience. But I want to just highlight that we don't believe judges uh, don't have a good heart. My personal opinion is they want to do the right thing. But it really boils down to that education piece that we're trying so hard to implement. We want to make sure that they have all the tools necessary to make better decisions. I know that judges work hard. They hear a lot of cases. I know that their intention is to try and protect children, but it's not about them per se, but it's about what they have in front of them. And so we believe that Peaky's Law is going to develop training that will help them understand what victims go through, what our children are going through, survivors are going through. That's all we want, more education so these judges are better prepared. We do want to thank everyone that works in family court for working really hard in a system that's already stressed. They hear so many cases, so it must not be easy to have people's lives in your hand. But we do want to have that education piece. We want them to be prepared. So please help us pass Peaky's Law. Please call your legislators to ensure that they vote yes and help us pass this critically important piece of legislation. There are two more that I want to ha highlight. And that is SB 690, another bill that I'm currently pushing through. And that will extend the statute of limitations for victims of domestic violence to come forward from five years to 15 years. We have reports that clearly state that the trauma will last anywhere from eight to 10 years when victims finally feel comfortable coming forward. So we wanna ensure that victims have the time to heal. So we wanna push for 15 years. That's SB 690. Another bill that I'm currently pushing forward along with these advocates is SB 459 that will make it easier to modify a restraining order, which currently in California we do not have. Sometimes mothers can experience escalating behavior from their abusive partner who currently have restraining orders, and they're having to wait until the restraining, over, uh, the restraining order is done. This bill, SB 459, will allow victims to modify a restraining order when they witness escalating behavior. In Eliana's case, where her three little girls were murdered, he had gone to her house, he had assaulted police officers, he was verbalizing his distress, saying he wanted to kill himself and harm others, and yet these little girls continued to be allowed to go to his house. He was held in a 5150, and the evidence continued to pile up, and yet there was nothing they can do because California doesn't have the ability to modify a restraining order. So this bill, SB 459, will make that easy for any parent struggling when their children is sent to an abusive home to modify. So please help us push for SB 459. 
SB 690, and Piki's Law. We thank you for your time. Thank you. And if anybody has any questions, we are all going to gather here. If anybody needs uh, to talk to any of the victims or myself, we're here. Thank you.